How many of you picked up an odd new hobby during the pandemic? Sourdough bread making? Roller skating? Long conversations with your cat. I did. I brought home a chicken. Not a chicken sandwich or a chicken tender, but a real live chicken. You see, many months into the pandemic, I actually found myself very depressed. Before the pandemic, I had been on a plane every week almost with my job. I run a nonprofit that works to end factory farming, the cruel system of food production that treats animals like machines instead of the sentient beings that they are, locking them in cages and crates and warehouses never to see the light of day. My job was exciting, and I felt really effective with all that activity and travel. Then the pandemic hit, and I was still running the same nonprofit, but from my basement while trying to homeschool three kids. I was paralyzed by social isolation and so much fear. Fear for my kids' education, for my parents' health, for sustaining my organization's income. It was overwhelming, and I went from feeling invincible to helpless. And the question that lurked in my mind might be one that you all have from time to time. Does what I do matter? Then something unexpected happened that would change how I see myself and my work. I got a call to visit a chicken farmer. He was fed up, and he wanted to talk to me about getting out of the chicken factory farming business. It's not necessarily that easy for farmers to just quit. They're often saddled with debt and have few economic opportunities in their area. I didn't hesitate to go. Armed with my PPE, I got out of that basement and out of my neighborhood for the first time in many months. Something told me it would be worth it. On this visit, I waded through tens of thousands of birds stuffed wall to wall. It was a sea of suffering, of fragile bodies, some barely able to walk because of their unnaturally fast growth rate. They sit on a mixture of wood shavings, feces, feed, feathers, and blood. And that waste builds up flock after flock, often creating air that is thick with ammonia. This is the way the majority of chickens in this country are raised for meat. This is one of the worst normalized atrocities in our society. Every being in this warehouse has some degree of pain and suffering, and it is my job to bear witness to, expose, to end and replace this cruel form of food production. But one thing I never do is take any animals. There are just too many of them. In this one visit alone, there were four warehouses each with 15,000 individuals in them. So I focus on changing institutions rather than saving individual chickens. But on this day, I found myself conflicted. This was the day that all the birds were being brought to slaughter, 60,000 in total, loaded into a truck and brought to their final end. And as I was getting ready to leave, the farmer said to me, there's a few that have been left behind, deemed unworthy, even for slaughter, too sick or damaged or small. Before the catch crew come through, these chickens, they belong to a big poultry company. After, the farmer's just responsible for getting rid of them. They are essentially abandoned property that he has to dispose of. And with sorrow in his eyes, this farmer said to me, if I have to hand kill even a few less, that would be just fine with me. And he walked out, leaving me standing in this warehouse all alone. It was clear to me that he too found it unacceptable that these living beings are treated like trash. So I took one. 
I put her in a big black bin, I put her in my car, and I drove away. Her name is Henrietta. At first, Henrietta was timid, and we had to keep her in the bathroom shower where she could be protected and grow stronger. She had a gut infection, a chest infection. She could barely walk. She had such weakness that she couldn't even perch. And so we put a broomstick low to the ground where she could rest. She was scared of the grass. She had never seen anything but the inside of a dark, filthy warehouse. Fresh air and sunshine were alien to her. The first time we brought her out in a box, she just stayed in the corner of that box. But the next time, she stepped out into that grass and she lifted one foot and then the other, as if really taking in the feel of the, in the grass for the first time. And with our love and our encouragement, she slowly started to explore. And before long, she was all over the garden, including eating my cucumber and tomato plants. She began to heal. And weeks turned into months, and months turned into a year. And this summer, we celebrated Henrietta's Hatch Day. <laughs> she wasn't supposed to live beyond six weeks. That's the age that chickens are brought to slaughter, when they're still babies. And here she was, getting Hatch Day presents of strawberries and blackberries. It was then that I reflected on the seeds that Henrietta had planted in my heart. When you work on big, big social change, it can be really hard to stay motivated. Progress is slow. So how can we stay energized? Henrietta taught me about resilience, and she taught me three lessons. The first is, have direct contact with the change you're trying to make. I was trying to create a more compassionate world, but before Henrietta, all I did was expose myself to suffering. Suffering in undercover videos, firsthand farm visits, advocacy materials. I had lost touch with the positive place I was aiming for, the very vision that motivated me. She reminded me of the place I was aiming for, where all animals are respected, protected, and free. I loved Henrietta immediately. And my family's interest and passion in her recovery brought us so much joy, especially my seven-year-old daughter, who's so outgoing. Can you imagine being that age and going through the pandemic? We didn't even realize how much she needed a friend. They did everything together, virtual school, shared snacks, and even painted their nails. <laughs> My daughter taught her how to ride the Roomba and a skateboard. She pushed her around the neighborhood in the stroller. You should have seen the looks we got. We discovered that Henrietta preferred the wide, dark green blades of grass over the light, thin blades of grass. And when I would weed in the garden, she'd follow alongside me as I pulled and dug. She would scratch and peck, letting off this sweet, low chirping sound. If I call her name, she comes running. Our babysitter said, this is the friendliest chicken I've ever met. <laughs> but who knows? Not many chickens get this chance. And although I didn't save the nine billion chickens that are raised and slaughtered in this country every year, I saved this one. And I noticed, however, so subtly, this softened my heart. It relieved a pressure valve. Day to day, I do focus on big systemic change, but moment to moment, Henrietta is this reminder of what I'm fighting for for billions of chickens like her. My second lesson is focus on what you can control and not on what you can't. Before Henrietta, I had this, this frenetic energy, this tense anticipation of how things would turn out. Did I choose the right strategy, make the right decision? But we can't know, and we can't let the not knowing crush us into inaction. 
We have to stop clinging to rigid plans and focus on our intentions. Instead of trying to make reality conform to our expectations, we have to look for opportunities to embrace our intentions, to practice those intentions. Who knew I'd have the chance to save an individual life, and who knew I'd actually do it? Certainly not my husband, who did not appreciate me showing up in the middle of the night with a smelly, dirty chicken. So instead of clinging to those rigid plans, I started to set intentions and think about those deeply. Day to day, I didn't know how long Henrietta would live for, or when my kids would go back to school, or when the pandemic would end. But instead of fretting and struggling with that control, I set intentions to love and to heal, to experience life with joy, and to keep working toward my mission to end factory farming. The last Henrietta wisdom is this. Don't intertwine the magnitude of a task with your worth. Your presence and your efforts have value. There's an ancient Jewish teaching that says, don't be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the task, nor are you free to abandon it. Don't let perfection be the enemy of progress. Just keep showing up, keep moving forward, and trust that your efforts have value. Intentions lead to actions, and an action can lead to a ripple effect of unknowable scope. I mean, here I am giving a talk about a chicken. <laughs> and as you face your daunting task, because we all have them, remember these three lessons. Focus on what you can control and not on what you can't. Connect to the joy at the center of your mission. And don't intertwine the magnitude of the task with your worth. Your efforts are the seeds of change. I took a broken chicken who was unfit for slaughter, and she taught me what it really means to be alive. And now, whenever I'm feeling like my work doesn't matter, or I'm overwhelmed by the enormity of the task, I just close my eyes and I imagine a million Henriettas looking at me with eyes of gratitude. I see my daughter sharing a cuddle with Henrietta, and I center myself in that joy. Thank you.